Notes on the Bhagavad Gita by William Q. Judge Chapter 17 In the twelfth chapter, it speaks of devotion through faith, founded on knowledge of the Supreme Spirit. The present chapter explains the nature of the faith of those while they neglect the precepts of the scriptures, recorded sacred knowledge, but yet worship in faith. Krishna says that the faith of mortals is of three kinds and is born from their own disposition and that this faith partakes of the qualities of sattva, truth, rajas, action, and tamas, indifference. These three qualities are specifically treated in the 14th chapter and the necessities there shown for the seeker after truth to raise himself above their influence. The 12th, the 14th, and the 17th chapters should all be studied together as they are intimately related. Quote, the faith of each one proceeds from the sattva quality. The embodied soul being gifted with faith, each man is of the same nature as that ideal on which his faith is fixed." End quote. Here, the word sattva should be given in its highest definition, quote, the power to understand, end quote, or the power to comprehend, which every embodied soul possesses, as contrasted with the limitations imposed upon that power by those who fix their faith upon some ideal of seeming good. Quote, Those who are of the disposition which ariseth from the prevalence of the sattva or the good quality worship the gods. End quote. Quote, gods, end quote, is a generic term covering many classes of invisible beings. Here the reference is to that class of being which the worshipper believes to be endowed with supernatural powers and virtues, and from which is sought guidance and faith. Quote, Those of the quality of Rajas worship the celestial powers, the Yakshas or the Rakshashas, end quote. That is, those in whom the desire for personal and selfish possessions and attainments prevail seek the aid of and attract elemental beings who in irresponsible ways aid in such accomplishments. In other words, where the quality of rajas prevails, any external force that will aid in the fulfillment of desires is sought and welcomed, regardless of its nature or the evil effect upon others. Such forces or beings belong to the separative and destructive side of nature. Quote, Other men in whom the dark quality of indifference or tamas predominates worships elemental powers in the ghosts of dead men. End quote. Reader's note, like the physical man Jesus. End of reader's note. Here, the elemental powers are those of the lowest class, and among them are the so-called, quote, spirits, end quote, of the seances rooms, which are galvanized into factitious presentations of life and intelligence by mediums, as well as some of the sitters. And this is the lowest class of elementaries and elementals, which belong to the grossest part of the invisible nature. It is the nearest to the physical and the most easily aroused. The opening of the doors to this class arises from ignorance of man's true nature and makes possible the delusion which fixes the faith on impermanent, irresponsible, and vampirizing influences. Tamas also predominates in those who practice severe self-mortification they are full of hypocrisy and pride, longing for what is past and desiring more to come. They, 
full of delusion, torture the powers and the faculties which are within the body, and me, Krishna, also, who am in the recesses of the innermost heart, know that, that they are of an infernal tendency. It is a matter of common knowledge that many kinds of self-inflicted bodily punishments and tortures prevail among certain devotees in the East as a mean of development, and that even among Western peoples a similar idea at one time prevailed extensively and perhaps maybe even still exists in some quarters today. There is no doubt that these practices had their origin in a misunderstanding of a phrase frequently used in ancient scriptures, quote, mortification of the body, end quote. In this chapter, Krishna sets forth very clearly the true meaning of the phrase in these words, quote, honoring the gods or beings that are higher than man at this point. The Brahmins, those who have divine knowledge, the teachers of knowledge, and the wise, purity, rectitude, chastity, and harmlessness are called mortification of the body, end quote. That this is the true definition is shown by the fact that the body of itself is incapable of action and is merely an organized aggregation of physical matter used and controlled by the thinker and actor within. It is this thinker and actor who needs to change his modes of thought and his actions. In changing from one mode of thought and action to another of an opposite kind, the man finds himself at war with habits which he himself established. These have to be disestablished by the institution of habits in accord with his changed basis. In a true sense, this mortification of the body is but from within outwards and not by any external means. Similarly, quote, Austerities of speech, end quote, do not consist of a severity of tone and manner, or of a puritanical contempt for the average person and his interests, a state due to an ingrowing self-righteousness, but are practiced and shown in, quote, gentle speech, which causes no anxiety, which is truthful and friendly, and diligence in the reading of scriptures, end quote. Quote, mortification of the mind, end quote, is not affected by imposed prayers or penances, nor by offerings to any supposed deity, but by, quote, serenity of mind, mildness of temper, silence, self-restraint, an absolute straightforwardness of conduct, end quote. The chapter continues by saying, quote, this threefold mortification or austerity practiced with supreme faith and by those who long not for a reward is of the sattva quality, end quote. Quote, but that austerity which is practiced with hypocrisy for the sake of obtaining respect for oneself or for fame or for favor and which is uncertain in belonging wholly to this world is of the quality of right. Quote, those austerities which are practiced merely by wounding oneself or from a false judgment or from hurting another are all the quality of Tamas." End quote. The idea prevails among Western peoples that the value of a gift lies in, an, in its intrinsic value. Krishna presents the contrary fact 
that the value of a gift lies entirely in the attitude of mind which accompanies the gift. This applies to gifts and benefactions of every kind, whether seasonal or not, and whether to friends, to relatives, acquaintances, or strangers, or to the poor. It would be very well to remember this in the season of Christmas and the holiday giving. Krishna specifies and qualifies the different attitudes as follows, quote, those gifts which are bestowed at the proper time to the proper person and by men who are not desirous of a return are of the sattva quality, good and of the nature of truth. End quote. Quote, but that gift which is given with the expectation of a return from the beneficiary or with a view to spiritual benefit flowing therefrom or with reluctance all of the rasha's quality bad and partaketh of untruth end quote quote gifts given out of place and season and to unworthy persons without proper attention and scornfully are of the tamas quality wholly bad and of the nature of darkness what a commentary this is upon our Western ideas of charity as ordinarily dispensed and particularly upon our charitable organizations how many gifts or charities are bestowed without a view to spirit how many subscriptions are made to charities with reluctance or from a desire to appear generous in the eyes of men how many are given, quote, out of place and season and to unworthy persons without proper attention and scornfully? Each one must answer for himself. It takes a very wise man to do good works without danger of doing incalculable harm. One such might, by his great intuitive powers, know whom to believe and whom to leave in the mire that is their best teacher, end quote. The poor and wretched themselves will tell anyone who is able to win their confidence what disastrous mistakes are made by those who come from a different class and try to help them. Kindness and gentle treatment will sometimes bring out the worst qualities of a man or woman who has led a fairly presentable life when kept down by pain and despair. The Gita teaches that the causes of misery do not lie in conditions or circumstances, but in the mistaken ideas and actions of the man himself, for he reaps what he has sown in ignorance. A better knowledge of the nature of man and the purpose of life is needed, and this is acquired. The causes of misery are gradually eliminated. No greater charity can be bestowed upon suffering humanity than right knowledge that leads to right action. The possessor of this knowledge will be filled with divine sympathy for all sufferers. He will relieve only such distresses as should be relieved in each and every case, while at the same time he will impart as much of his greater knowledge as the sufferer can receive and apply but he will not let his left hand know what his right hand does. He will have no thought of reward, nor even of gratitude. He will simply do all that he can, and the best he knows how to do, to raise the sufferer to a higher plane of thought and action, while he affords sufficient physical relief to give a foothold. This chapter is the last but one of the Bhagavad Gita, and perhaps as the chapter, is the most comprehensive one, for it presents the one true faith, founded upon knowledge of the Supreme Spirit, the Self within, the knower in every mortal body, as well as the three kinds of false faith, fixed upon externality. It considers true practices as the natural outcome of true faith. 
in contrast with erroneous practices based on false faiths. It shows clearly that spiritual reliance placed upon any external being, thing, or practice prevents right knowledge and true progress and cannot fail to bring out detrimental karmic results. Knowledge of and action for the self of all or the self within is necessary in every thought, every word, and every act even in the providing of food for the body. Krishna does not enjoin any particular kind of food. He says that kind of food for each one is best, quote, which increases the length of days, vigor, and strength, which keeps one free from sickness, of tranquil mind, and contented, and which is savory, nourishing, of permanent benefit and congenial to the body is that which is attractive to those in whom the sattva quality prevaileth." End quote. There are many who fix their faith on one particular kind of food and who endeavor to convert others to that particular kind of faith. They, like all others who fix their faith upon externalities, are quote, false pietists and of a bewildered soul." End quote. The question never is of what kinds of food, but of fitness for each particular case. For when all is said and done, each body extracts from any kind of food only that which conforms to the nature of the possessor of that body, and the nature is subject to change from within. The main thing to be observed is to keep the body efficient as an instrument for the soul who inhabits it, by whatever means and food may be found necessary for the purpose. Here, like and dislike are set aside and only the purpose of soul is considered. Quote, the food which is liked by those of the Rajah's quality is over bitter too acid, excessively salty, hot, pungent, dry, and burning, and causeth unpleasantness, pain, and disease." End quote. Reader's note, I just want to um, point out that we need to be thinking about spiritual food. Spiritual food. The faith being fixed on the desire for personal possessions and attainments, desire becomes cumulative. Each object obtained only stimulates the desire for more. This produces corresponding and cumulative tendencies within the body. Quote, whatever food is such as was dressed the day before, that is tasteless or rotting, that is impure, is that which is preferred by those in whom, whom predominates the quality of Tomas, or indifference, end quote. Where Tomas prevails, there is a tendency for, and an affiliation with, the lower elementals and elements of nature, or the destructive and disintegrating side. The last section of this chapter refers to the threefold designation of the Supreme Spirit as Om Tat Sat, the triune deity in its triple aspects corresponding to creation, preservation, and destruction, while recreating or in order to recreate. The word Om or Om is at once an invocation of the highest within, a benediction, an affirmation, and a promise. Its proper use is said to lead to the realization of the true self within. The Om contains within itself all the aspects and implies the universe controlled by the Supreme Spirit. It represents the constant current of meditation which ought to be carried on by every man, 
even while engaged in the necessary duties of his life. There is, for every conditioned being, a target at which the aim is constantly directed. In the Mundaka Upanishad, there is the following, quote, Om is the bow, the self is the arrow, and Brahman is called its aim, end quote. It is to be hit by a man who is not thoughtless, and then as the arrow becomes one with the target, he will become one with Brahman. Know him alone as the self and leave off all other words. He is the bridge of the immortal. Meditate on the self as all. End quote. And that concludes chapter 17, Notes on the Bhagavad Gita by William Kwan Judge. Um, I didn't even realize that it had been almost a year since I did the last one and um, it's almost Christmas time and unironically I picked right back up and um, this portion of the book is speaking about Christmas time so with that um, love yourselves and love each other and all life unconditionally until the next time peace